The Master Key System, Part 24 Enclosed, you will find Part 24, your final lesson of this course. If you have practiced each of the exercises a few minutes every day, as suggested, you will have found that you can get out of life exactly what you wish by first putting into life that which you wish. And you will probably agree with the student who said, the thought is almost overwhelming, so vast, so available, so definite, so reasonable, and so usable. The fruit of this knowledge is, as it were, a gift of the gods. It is the truth that makes men free. Not only free from every lack and limitation, but free from sorrow, worry, and care. And is it not wonderful to realize that this law is no respecter of persons, that it makes no difference what your habit of thought may be, the way has been prepared. If you are inclined to be religious, the greatest religious teacher the world has ever known made the way so plain that all may follow. If your mental bias is toward physical science, the law will operate with mathematical certainty. If you are inclined to be philosophical, Plato or Emerson may be your teacher. But in either case, you may reach degrees of power to which it is impossible to assign any limit. An understanding of this principle, I believe, is the secret for which the ancient alchemists vainly sought, because it explains how gold in the mind may be transmuted into gold in the heart and in the hand. When the scientists first put the sun in the center of the solar system and sent the earth spinning around it, there was immense surprise and consternation. The whole idea was self-evidently false. Nothing was more certain than the movement of the sun across the sky, and anyone could see it descend behind the western hills and sink into the sea. Scholars raged, and scientists rejected the idea as absurd. Yet the evidence has finally carried conviction in the minds of all. We speak of a bell as a sounding body. Yet we know that all the bell can do is to produce vibrations in the air. When these vibrations come at the rate of 16 per second, they cause a sound to be heard in the mind. It is also possible for the mind to hear vibrations up to the rate of 38,000 vibrations per second. When the number increases beyond this, all is silence again, so that we know that the sound is not in the bell, it is in our own mind. We speak and even think of the sun as giving light, yet we know it is simply giving forth energy which produces vibrations in the ether at the rate of 400 trillion a second, causing what are termed light waves, so that we know that what we call light is simply a form of energy, and that the only light there is is the sensation caused in the mind by the motion of the waves. When the number increases, the light changes in color, each change in color being caused by shorter and more rapid vibrations, so that although we speak of the rose as being red, the grass as being green, or the sky as being blue, we know that the colors exist only in our minds and are the sensations experienced by us as the result of the vibrations of light waves. When the vibrations are reduced below 400 trillion a second, they no longer affect us as light, but we experience the sensation of heat. It is evident, therefore, that we cannot depend upon the evidence of the senses for our information concerning the realities of things. If we did, we should believe that the sun moved, that the world was flat instead of round, that the stars were bits of light instead of vast suns. The whole range, then, of the theory and practice of any system of metaphysics consists in knowing the truth concerning yourself and the world in which you live. In knowing that, in order to express harmony, you must think harmony. In order to express health, you must think health. And in order to express abundance, 
you must think abundance. To do this, you must reverse the evidence of the senses. When you come to know that every form of disease, sickness, lack, and limitation are simply the result of wrong thinking, you will have come to know the truth which shall make you free. You will see how mountains may be removed. If these mountains consist only of doubt, fear, distrust, or other forms of discouragement, they are nonetheless real, and they need not only to be removed, but to be cast into the sea. Your real work consists in convincing yourself of the truth of these statements. When you have succeeded in doing this, you will have no difficulty in thinking the truth, and, as has been shown, the truth contains a vital principle and will manifest itself. Those who heal diseases by mental methods have come to know this truth. They demonstrate it in their lives and the lives of others daily. They know that life, health, and abundance are omnipresent, filling all space. And they know that those who allow disease or lack of any kind to manifest have as yet not come into an understanding of this great law. As all conditions are thought creations and therefore entirely mental, disease and lack are simply mental conditions in which the person fails to perceive the truth. As soon as the error is removed, the condition is removed. The method for removing this error is to go into the silence and know the truth. As all mind is one mind, you can do this for yourself or anyone else. If you have learned to form mental images of the conditions desired, this will be the easiest and quickest way to secure results. If not, results can be accomplished by argument, by the process of convincing yourself absolutely of the truth of your statement. Remember, and this is one of the most difficult as well as most wonderful statements to grasp, remember that no matter what the difficulty is, no matter where it is, no matter who is affected, you have no patient but yourself. You have nothing to do but to convince yourself of the truth which you desire to see manifested. This is an exact scientific statement in accordance with every system of metaphysics in existence, and no permanent results are ever secured in any other way. Every form of concentration, forming mental images, argument, and auto-suggestion are all simply methods by which you are enabled to realize the truth. If you desire to help someone, to destroy some form of lack, limitation, or error, the correct method is not to think of the person whom you wish to help. The intention to help them is entirely sufficient, as this puts you in mental touch with the person. Then drive out of your own mind any belief of lack, limitation, disease, danger, difficulty, or whatever the trouble might be. As soon as you have succeeded in doing this, the result will have been accomplished, and the person will be free. But remember that thought is creative, and consequently, every time you allow your thought to rest on any inharmonious condition, you must realize that such conditions are apparent only. They have no reality. That spirit is the only reality, and it can never be less than perfect. All thought is a form of energy, a rate of vibration, but a thought of the truth is the highest rate of vibration known, and consequently destroys every form of error in exactly the same way that light destroys darkness. No form of error can exist when the truth appears, so that your entire mental work consists in coming into an understanding of the truth. This will enable you to overcome every form of lack, limitation, or disease of any kind. We can get no understanding of the truth from the world without. The world without is relative only. Truth is absolute. We must, therefore, find it in the world within. To train the mind to see truth only 
is to express true conditions only. Our ability to do this will be an indication as to the progress we are making. The absolute truth is that the I is perfect and complete. The real I is spiritual and can therefore never be less than perfect. It can never have any lack, limitation, or disease. The flash of genius does not have origin in the molecular motion of the brain. It is inspired by the ego, the spiritual I, which is one with the universal mind. And it is our ability to recognize this unity, which is the cause of all inspiration, all genius. These results are far-reaching and have effect upon generations yet to come. They are the pillars of fire which mark the path that millions follow. Truth is not the result of logical training or of experimentation or even of observation. It is the product of a developed consciousness. Truth within a Caesar manifests in a Caesar's deportment, in his life and his action. His influence upon social forms and progress. Your life and your actions and your influence in the world will depend upon the degree of truth which you are enabled to perceive, for truth will not manifest in creeds, but in conduct. Truth manifests in character, and the character of a man should be the interpretation of his religion, or what to him is truth, and this will in turn be evidenced in the character of his possession. If a man complains of the drift of his fortune, he is just as unjust to himself as if he should deny rational truth, though it stand patent and irrefutable. Our environment and the innumerable circumstances and accidents of our lives already exist in the subconscious personality which attracts to itself the mental and physical material which is congenial to its nature. Thus, our future being determined from our present, and if there should be apparent injustice in any feature or phase of our personal life, we must look within for the cause, try to discover the mental fact which is responsible for the outward manifestation. It is this truth which makes you free, and it is the conscious knowledge of this truth which will enable you to overcome every difficulty. The conditions with which you meet in the world without are invariably the result of the conditions obtaining in the world within. Therefore, it follows with scientific accuracy that by holding the perfect ideal in mind, you can bring about ideal conditions in your environment. If you see only the incomplete, the imperfect, the relative, the limited, these conditions will manifest in your life. But if you train your mind to see and realize the spiritual ego, the I, which is forever perfect and complete, harmonious, wholesome, and healthful conditions only will be manifested. As thought is creative, and the truth is the highest and most perfect thought which anyone can think, it is self-evident that to think the truth is to create that which is true. And it is again evident that when truth comes into being, that which is false must cease to be. The universal mind is the totality of all mind which is in existence. Spirit is mind, because spirit is intelligent. The words are, therefore, synonymous. The difficulty with which you have to contend is to realize that mind is not individual. It is omnipresent. It exists everywhere. In other words, there is no place where it is not. It is, therefore, universal. Men have heretofore generally used the word God to indicate this universal creative principle. But the word God does not convey the right meaning. Most people understand this word to mean something outside of themselves while exactly the contrary is the fact. It is our very life. Without it, we would be dead. We would cease to exist. The minute the spirit leaves the body, we are as nothing. Therefore, spirit is really all there is of us. Now, 
the only activity which the spirit possesses is the power to think. Therefore, thought must be creative, because spirit is creative. This creative power is impersonal, and your ability to think is your ability to control it and make use of it for the benefit of yourself and others. When the truth of this statement is realized, understood, and appreciated, you will have come into possession of the master key. But remember that only those who are wise enough to understand, broad enough to weigh the evidence, firm enough to follow their own judgment, and strong enough to make the sacrifice exacted, may enter and partake. This week, try to realize that this is truly a wonderful world in which we live, that you are a wonderful being, that many are awakening to a knowledge of the truth, and as fast as they awake and come into a knowledge of the things which have been prepared for them, they too realize that I hath not seen nor ear heard, nor hath it entered into the heart of man, the splendors which exist for those who find themselves in the promised land. They have crossed the river of judgment and have arrived at the point of discrimination between the true and the false, and have found that all they ever willed or dreamed was but a faint concept of the dazzling reality. Though an inheritance of acres may be bequeathed, an inheritance of knowledge and wisdom cannot. The wealthy man may pay others for doing his work for him, but it is impossible to get his thinking done for him by another or to purchase any kind of self-culture. Samuel Smiles <laughs>